Sorry, I was kind of. Are you Tassia? Oh, you are here before me. Thank you. <laughs> I will let you go first, actually, if you are ready. No, that's fine. I'm really more interested in you than me. Oh, uh, So, Tassio has uh, kindly agreed to come and give a guest lecture. He's got uh, more than 10 years of experience. Uh, you know, RMIT students are very well behaved. Normally, they are. <laughs> Yeah, and so he's going to talk about some patterns, his uh, experience with refactoring, and so it's always good to hear from somebody from the industry. So thanks. Uh, yeah, sure. Do you need a? Oh, you got a connector for this. Uh, one. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I need that. So what do we have here? Right, we just have this. Uh, uh, Right, so we're going to have that for that one. We don't have that. Okay, you don't have a connector for that? No. Okay. Let me, um, what you need is... Uh, uh, BVI. BVI. Yeah. yeah. Okay, while you just talk to them, I'll go and try and find a BVI for them. Oh, yeah, yeah. it's just that the slides won't... No, no, you, you just talk to them while I try, when, try to find a BVI for you. Okay, okay. it's just that, well, all my talk is really behind. Based on that. Yeah, based on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is a DVI that you need, right? Yeah. Apart, and that will connect to you. Okay. All right, I'll get that for you. You just talk to them for the next few minutes uh, off the cuff. Uh, all right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right, um, I have no idea I'm going to talk about why he's about to have my slides to support me. So I guess I'll just do some introduction for now. Um, so my name is Tarsio. I work for Dias. Uh, that's the logo over here, so they'll be on the screen very soon. Um, Say hello to Pete Sorry? Say hello to Pete Oh, sure, I will do. Yeah. Um, so as uh, Charles said, I have about 10 years of experience in IT, uh, not only here, internationally as well. I've worked for, been working for this for about two years, more or less. And um, yeah, we call ourselves pretty much polyglot developers, like Java was the stuff that I started learning on. Um, and then after a few years, start playing with Groovy, and then you go JavaScript, and then you go uh, Clojure, and what else you, people throw at you, you just have to learn and apply that in industry, because that's pretty much how things work right now. Uh, which is pretty fun. Um, you get to learn new patterns, get to learn new things, get to, uh, to revise what you have learned in the past, which is... Uh, very, very valuable. Um, so, and at the moment, um, I'm with a company, like a client from this, and uh, we're doing a big security kind of project in this company, which is, is an interesting concept, but the whole thing is actually very boring. Uh, the, whole, the whole way that the code is set up is very hard to deal with. It's a legacy code base, about 10 years old, and it's a Java database, and there's a lot of things that seem wrong. It's homegrown, it's hard to get things going, so we take that extra effort to always understand what was done prior hand uh, until you actually get something done. Um, so this itself is a, um, it supports a lot of conferences. Have you guys heard of uh, Yao conference? Yeah, great conference to go to. A lot of smart people, they go there. Happens every year here in Melbourne, Sydney. And it just happened these last two days in, uh, in Perth, if you're interested to drop in there, it's for the conference. 
Um, we also uh, support random hacks of kindness. Anyone? No? Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit more about that at the end, which is uh, very worthwhile if you guys are interested in just hacking for the weekend, you know, spending a day doing just in front of the computer, just doing nothing. I mean, doing a lot, but I mean, it's away from home a little bit. Yeah? It's about a week and a half, isn't it? So it is, yeah, that's correct. It's at the end of the month, yeah. So I'll talk a bit more about that. Okay. Everybody knows it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and what else? Yeah, and uh, we have partnerships with companies in the US as well. So, for instance, last night we had a guy from NASA to come and talk to us about open innovation, which was very interesting. And how NASA, I don't know if you heard about the uh, Space Apps Challenge? Uh, yeah. No? Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, sure, man. Um, and, and that's pretty cool. Uh, NASA pretty much opens up its whole uh, data for you, an API, and you can build stuff. Uh, there are some guys that build some apps, iOS apps, web apps, Android apps, and whatever, just using the data, and even build APIs on top of the APIs because what NASA provides is actually a lot of raw data for you, and some of the stuff is just, yeah, you don't want to look at it. Um, so, so yeah, um, that's this and that's me. So uh, for everything else, I guess we we'll have to talk about what you guys have been doing so far, like. Refactoring patterns, um, overall patterns, can someone give me a line? Yep, getting a four. Uh, yep. Refactoring patterns, uh, analysis patterns we read over last week. Okay. Um, that's pretty much yeah. that's most of the code. Alright, so you probably heard of singletons, yep. factories, yep. builders, yep. commons, yep. strategies, yep. all that stuff. Okay, that's good, that's good enough. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that stuff. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about not to use them, really. Because, you know, it's all. No, no, don't run away. Don't run uh, away. It, it's actually uh, it's, it's a funny thing because everyone encourages you to use patterns because they're good and, like, oh, yeah, it's tested and all these four guys that were really smart that came up with that. But, yeah, it doesn't really work like that in the industry. Um, like, we, we apply them as we see fit. But at the same time, we don't, because sometimes a solution to a problem doesn't really have to include a pattern. Sometimes a solution to a problem actually involves you staying away from what all these experts have told you before and, and applying what best fits your organization, having a code that's maintainable, that's testable, and that can be enhanced. Now, of course you get all that from design patterns, but Applying a concept just because you're applying a concept doesn't really add much value to the company, you know? And probably you, you may feel super smart, but at the end of the day, people just look at us like, why didn't you just do that? And then half of the code is just gone. And you don't, like, you don't have to. <laughs> in a way, the whole thing just feels over engineered. And that's, that's a big problem in organizations these days. Like, we Java, Java has been around like forever. Um, and Java 8 just came in the last couple of months, and it's it's pretty much like it's a breath of fresh air, really, in the Java community because there's a lot of things that other languages like like Ruby, for instance, or Groovy, are actually doing very well. Um, and and all these patterns that we have studied over here over the last couple of years, we start to revise them and see, hey, hold on a minute, this stuff doesn't really apply anymore, or this thing could be done this way. And all these principles uh, and, and stuff that people have said before, uh, it doesn't really make sense right now. So Java applications are now becoming more like a legacy kind of thing. And a lot of people, including myself, have to maintain them. And, and maintain stuff that people have written like 10 years ago. I'm going to show you some code today that's, that's pretty old. And it's, it was, have you guys heard of Spring Framework? Yeah, okay, that's good, yeah, more hands than I thought. That's fantastic. So, this application was written in Spring Framework 2. It was just before 1.0 1, 1 was upgraded to 2. And that's like nine, eight years ago. You know, it's a very long time. And, uh, and you see some patterns in there that are just, it makes you cringe, it's horrible. And to deal with that stuff, you have to go back revise those learnings from 10 years ago and say, oh my god, okay, so that's how you should do things. Here you go, back to the future. 
and let's do this thing again, break it up, and see how we can modernize these so we can make the test, the, uh, the code testable, small, and maintainable. Um, but for all that, I need my slides, and I uh, don't have that stuff. So, um, yeah, I don't know what else you guys can tell me. Does anyone have like a VGA adapter for Mac? That will help. No? Forgot at home. All right. Yeah, well, I don't have, I have a DPI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't help either. Um, yeah, okay. So who's, who's in the industry today? Yeah, okay. And you guys <coughs> been doing mostly Java? Dot .NET. Dot .NET? Dot .NET, SharePoint, yeah, all that stuff. Okay. Um, and you... I don't know, let's just chit chat a little bit. So, what do you guys like? Yeah, sure, go. Just a, just a question. You're yeah. talking about Java 8 and some of the new stuff that comes in. Like, I come from very much like a C sharp and Ruby background. Yeah. So, like, all of the functional stuff, like, we've been doing for years. Like, as a Java developer, you're finding yourself embracing some of the new design patterns, like, and map reduce and functional kind of stuff in, like, new Java apps, or is it still a bit too fresh to be playing with it? Uh, well, you see, because because these concepts have been tested for a while now in other languages, people are seeing the value in it. Um, unfortunately, for a company to go, like at the moment, the project that I'm in is Java 6, yeah. right? Um, and for, for one company to go from Java 6 to 7 and then from 7 to 8, it takes a lot of political debating, which is very frustrating. Um, what I see in the industry, because is people using mostly in JavaScript, a lot of MapReduce, um, a lot of um, uh, yeah, playing with collections and some other, uh, some other functional patterns. Um, and Scala is playing a big role in the JVM at the moment as well, in bringing that stuff forward. So people are embracing it, which is really, really cool. Um, if the Java community will adopt that, well, I don't know. A lot of Java developers that I know have moved over to Groovy. Um, a lot of them are moving over to Scala as well, Enclosure which have patterns of their own as well. So I guess the short answer is yes, I see a trend that's moving up, but very slowly. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, I think, okay, I think we have a go, actually. So we have... All right, I have that here. And uh, 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 no. <laughs> All right. So what uh, what kind of code do you use? Uh, yeah. So um, so this guy, you see how he has yeah. that stuff. I can't really connect to it. So what I can do, I can try to transfer my slides to a um, PDF okay. and run from the computer over here. Okay, never mind. I've called uh, these guys that will be here, so, so I can just fix it. All right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, sure, man. Yeah. Uh, actually, trying yet. Okay, uh, Tassio actually was supposed to start at 6.30, but he came early, so uh, I think while he's uh, getting that fixed up, uh, maybe we'll do a survey um, just to find out how we can improve this course. Uh, as I told you before, uh, we have actually changed a lot this time. We have brought in uh, refactoring, VBC, uh, and also the assignment structure we have changed. So I'd like to know your feedback and see how we can improve uh, this year. Um, I think one thing with uh, teaching uh, that I, I always uh, want to do thing in teaching, they say that in teaching you can never make 100% happy. If you can make 60% of the people happy, 60% of the times they say you're doing well. You know what I mean? There are always such a diversity, even in a class like this. You've got people with 20 years of experience, and you've got people who have never worked in the industry, right? So it's kind of finding the right balance. So, um, so anyway, uh, but your feedback. Obviously, I don't have full control. I'm at the head of school, but I can still 
Hi, I'm Austin. I'm going to change the post to make it uh, more uh, you know, suitable. So, uh, so in terms of reading, there were too many assignments. No. So I think that mainly the tools is the one probably that caused a bit of uh, hassle. But um, uh, next time, uh, so also uh, it's probably a good time for me as I'm setting the exam. It's all fresh in my mind. I'm just telling you the exam is actually five questions. Uh, um, Twenty percent is on multiple choice, pretty much knowledge based. Twenty percent is on um, design by contract. Because you put in so much of effort, I must also examine that, see whether you're really all your effort is uh, you know not wasted. And 20% will be on refactoring, uh, and the other 40% is on uh, design patterns. So we will uh, basically um, uh, have one question where you will recognize which pattern is appropriate, and the other one will be um, doing a detailed design. Right. So uh, yeah. So we can be, this is anonymous feedback. So uh, any any input you give would be valuable. So. So. No, that's fine. I actually found a solution. I can export that to the web and run from that computer. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For sure. Uh, if you don't mind hanging hanging around for a few minutes. Is that, is that computer on? Yeah. Actually, I don't need that. Oh yeah, by the way, how's your project going? Uh, is next week's presentation, are we good to go? That's a lot of it. Implementation and not much design. So do you want to swap the order around? That means do revision next week and do your presentation in week four? Yeah. What do you mean? Uh, you're supposed to do your presentation next week, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I could check with uh, Keith and have the revision next week and have the presentation in week 12. Yeah, yeah well, that's why we're going to have any anyway. mm -hmm. Four hours for um, yeah. oh, no, My point was it's just that there's, no, there's a lot of implementation. Oh, right. Yeah. You know, set up database servers. Yeah, especially for your uh, the one that you have chosen, right? Uh, uh, some people don't have easy enough. Yeah, but what they're saying in the relational database. So you want to demonstrate in the lab, is that right? Is that what you're saying? You want to do it in the lab? Is that what you're saying? Oh, uh, well, cool. Yeah, sure. Go for it. Thanks, Thanks man. Digital Ocean right. server in the cloud. Okay. Yeah. Set it up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, correct. It said exactly what the marks will be based from. For example, how are we on demo? Yeah. Uh, and then six uh, six marks will be requirements. The remaining four marks is based like robust and validation mm -hmm. and so on. The other ten marks is for features like maintainability, extensibility and that kind of thing, as well as so your original design and your improved design. Will we be expected to demonstrate those things, uh, you know, show them in the code or produce design? In the presentation as well, in the presentation. That, that there's no individual presentation, so it's only a group presentation. Yeah. yeah. There was one um, simple mark allocated for usability. 
Yeah. But how are you assessing that, given that usability is a pretty broad area? Yeah, I look at it. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, you probably get full marks for that anyway. So yeah. Is it like you want it? Or is it, you know, yeah, the user interface yeah. or, face or like how, what's uh, usability? I mean, basically nowadays all DUI-based systems are pretty usable, right? Yeah. So in the old days, you've got to remember the commands to actually do something, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so uh, it's not to be using the Yeah. I think the other thing is that, like, for example, maintainability, right? So how do you uh, just yeah, say, uh, okay, so you can say, if this change, this is how we are uh, uh, allow for it in our system, right? So. Uh, Actually, I was going to talk about uh, uh, a little bit on architecture. In architecture, one of the things is about how maintainable are your system? Uh, how do you allow, allow for that? <coughs> so um, basically, if you can say, for example, extensibility, uh, let's say if you are doing um, what kind of assignment you will extend. Let's say if you are doing a robot assignment, let's say I can easily extend this to uh, three robot collaboration. Or if you have a traffic light signal, let's say you only have two junctions, you can say you can easily extend it to three or four junctions, right? So uh, that's what we mean. So it's been given out, and it's a week ago. What are you looking for? Yeah. I might. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so can we assume that I'll look at that. Can we assume the presentation will be week 12 or will you have? Oh, okay, let me ask you, how many of you would have rather have it in week 12? Yeah. Oh, you want to get it done or yeah. down with it next week? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I, I, I still need to we'll ask him. I don't think he should have any objection. That means next week he will do revision because the presentation doesn't have anything to do with the, you know. So that way, um, just, uh, I, I know that. Uh, uh, what I hear from students is some of them haven't even put together things. They're still on their own. Like I'm sure when you put things together, it, it does take a bit of time to get them to work okay. together, right? Okay. You know? nice. That's why I think you know coming up with a proper interface is in the first place <coughs> probably uh, you know uh, it's a good idea. Yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah. Does that mean if we do postpone by a week? Uh, that we also deliver the code on the same day? Yeah, pretty much. Or at the end of uh, Sunday. So you've got to still about three days to after, after, after that. that. Yeah. Mm. I mean, code you can submit until Sunday night. So. You know, we don't normally like to go into the study week because you know, you're supposed to do the time. So anyone got objection? Uh, there's a rule which says unless 70% agree, we cannot change. Normally, students have, don't have a problem postponing the deadline, but again, you know, but anybody objecting postponing by one week? This is your time to speak, so nobody has objections, so you have uh, any issues? Unless you're going to be away in week 12. If any of you are going to be away in week 12, again, I can allow let you present next week, right? If that's a problem. So one group can present earlier. By the way, do you prefer, uh, one of the things I've asked is, do you want a single assignment or do you prefer having different assignments? I think I like the like what they say? I like the idea of one long assignment for the entire semester because you do have a lot of projects like that in the industry where you yeah. can work with the entire team. Try to keep a file on the entrance path. You're joking, right? Code right. Yeah. Okay. Um, wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. Right. And I think, I think you can think same way. What does that mean? More or less. Go down the properties and you might be able to copy the file path. Here we go. Sort of giving it some information. Ah, look at that. Yeah. And go in the code for a prototyping or proof of concept. Yeah. And then obviously the second iteration is where you start making the code, but then that feeds right. back into a All the design again, yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of an agile approach. Yes. Right? Yeah. That's what yeah. people are doing. Um, yeah, so uh, well, one of the reasons why I gave different projects is that, for example, in some uh, projects, interpreter may never be used. Yeah. Right? So this time I gave different assignments. Some interpreter can be used, some bridge pattern can be used. Right? So pretty much you will probably see all the patterns being used, even proxy, because you've got RMI. Right? So that's the reason I, I thought, let's try it. It's the first time we gave different projects. 
obviously in everything there's always pros and cons. So, uh, and in fact, I mean, one of the things uh, we are having discussion with our colleagues is that learning has become totally different. First year students, for example, they are grown up with uh, Google, grown up with mobile phones. They don't want to come and listen to a lecture for two hours. Can you blame them? They just can't do it. So we are thinking of reversing it. Instead of uh, giving to our lecture, maybe we upload the lecture, read it first, come to the lecture, have interaction. Maybe I can just develop part of the robot assignment or whatever that we do, uh, do it there. So, you know what I mean, the whole thing is changing now. The once upon a time university lecturer just came and gave all the knowledge, he only had the knowledge. Nowadays, you can get all the knowledge you want from so many different sources. Right? So, so I think we also in the process of changing how we, uh, you know, deliver the things. So, it, you know what I mean. So the whole world is changing, right? It I'm is. sure. Absolutely. In, uh, you were saying that you always have to learn new, new technologies. How do you do it? Um, I don't know. Look, I usually what I do as a developer, I usually attend a lot of meetups. Yeah. Um, and get to know people that are doing that stuff, and mm -hmm. you know, ask them the challenges and stuff like that. Yeah. So, and sometimes I run side projects, like at the moment I, I'm, I'm, a <laughs> I'm tangled into the uh, Internet of Things yeah. um, okay. and coding Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and stuff like that yeah. and I'm learning a lot about Python and Node.js, yeah. which is a lot of fun. Um, and yeah. you get to share that stuff and then you learn yeah. the things and sure. you know. So even for me, like for example, I'm involved with a project or getting involved in a project and that uh, the client said, uh, you know, it's like a grant. Mm. I want you to use Angular framework. Mm, mm. You know, so in a way, it's good because when we are exposed to that, we also pass it on to the students. So I think, uh, personally, if you ask me, I think we should introduce these tools Absolutely. rather than mm. just relying on PHP and you know some of the uh, oh, geez, uh, Python and so on. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so look, whether we like it or not, we have to move ahead with time. So I'm sure it's the same for you, same for us. So for us, of course, we got our research targets as well, so which is yeah. not easy, right? So. so you mentioned about the robot assignment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's just funny you mentioned because it's actually used in the industry quite a lot right. as a test for a candidate in oh a company. Okay, yeah. um, uh, for instance, companies like REA, um, A and Z, yeah. and uh, where else did it have to be? Um, and uh, Open University of Australia as well. Yeah. So they all asked me to create a version of the robot that moves yeah. in a board, is that it? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it's it. It's so going to do certain tasks and that's then yeah, yeah. not only do it and we also measure how efficiently it's doing it. So yeah. the students normally like, uh, even the better students get challenged by it. And this time I gave an assignment, it's a game for the first year, first semester student. Mm, mm. So I'm worried because the good students just can catch anything. Mm. You throw anything at them they will go and learn by themselves. <laughs> but not so good students or needy of the students, they, they might sometimes, you mm. know, yes, get so uh, intimidated. Yeah. So how do you balance it? I'm not sure. We are still, you know, so what, what we, we, a few of our lecturers who are teaching programming, we were talking about it. We, we were saying that we really have to change with times. Mm. That we can't have a massive lecture theater where you go and listen for two hours. What do you think? Mm. Is it effective listening to a lecture for two hours? I would, I would probably drop to sleep, right? <laughs> 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 so, so, anyway. All right, okay, uh, so let's get back to this. Now I have slides. Um, all right, so I'm just going to skip this, uh, if I can, I guess. Uh, here you go, I have to click. So, introductions, here you go. Yeah, you can call me Mr. T. That's how people call me, usually. Uh, that, and that. And if you need to know some more, watch know some more, there's the links. Okay, that's the company logo I mentioned. Sure. Hey, hey. Um, all right, so I think I told you about that already. Yeah, so we're going to look at what's used and not used in the industry. So patterns and maybe some stuff that are a bit overused. Uh, so I'm just going to take you for a little bit of a journey of the, uh, on the code that we have been working on. Um, and just a little note about Spring Framework, uh, which some of you are familiar with. So I guess one thing to people who are, uh, let's go back here. Uh, here you go. Um, so it's all about that, right? Usability, maintainability, reuse, make sure that you have uh, a code that can be improved upon. Okay? But they don't solve everything, as I said. So you just have to be careful and make the right decisions at the right time. How you do that? Well, it's, it's, it's hard, okay? Usually, if you work within a team, you and your team work out the best solution along with that. 
sometimes if you work by yourself, you try to understand what the whole thing is about and say, oh yeah, I have these things that have been proven, that have been tested, I can apply that on the code. Um, and then you have people that will take the code, of course, which that's a different ballgame altogether. Um, so that's, just keep that in mind. Um, so what is have to use? So that stuff over here is actually, you know, I see that on every project I go, every single one. Uh, and it's used because it's simple, right? Simple to implement, it's simple to maintain, um, and, and you can you can abstract some complex concepts into these kind of patterns, and people will just look into that stuff and say, oh, okay, I know exactly what's going on here, right? Um, some people tend to overuse it, which it's not very good because things like Singleton, for instance, it can be uh, it can be a little bit hard to test. Um, but at the end of the day, it does save you time and it gives you a lot of flexibility moving forward with your code. Uh, and you have to be careful as well where you're going to apply that stuff. Like you don't want to apply a Singleton in a let's say in a domain class. Oh yeah, just give me that object. So like user dot get instance. Well. You know, you have more than one user in your database. You know, you might as well just create a proper user and instantiate that properly. Um, common pattern is a funny one. I put it out there. The last time I saw it was about two or three years ago. Um, it has been constant, uh, constantly replaced by the controller kind of pattern. Um, the common pattern was more like, okay, give me that stuff and execute one method that will do, uh, that will call my dependency and and it's a good action that I want you. But controllers are more or less like that. It's actually a bunch of commands that they get triggered by a HTTP request. So in a way, uh, it drives the behavior of your application by executing a command that you have to be executed for that specific action or that HTTP verb slash action. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, cool. And uh, strategy is something that you see, you, you see there, but not as much. Okay, it's something that you might, okay, strategy, pick the best algorithm for that specific scenario, um, and move on with it. And you have some guy over here that hey, contains a list of algorithms that you can instantiate, kind of thing. Um, it's good. Um, what I have seen a lot is the strategies being replaced by some sort of like, simple strategies have been replaced by maps, really. I have seen that a lot, actually, in Ruby. And, um, and groovy as well, See, because it's simple, right? But depending on the complex of defining your strategy to run with, uh, you might want to actually implement the pattern and make sure it does the appropriate thing at the right time. Um, another one that I implemented a couple of years ago um, was a template pattern, which was also very good, but I only saw the feature that time to implement a template pattern. And even though with Java being verbose the way it is, um, it just it just became bloated, unfortunately. And uh, the complexity of the solution, of the feature that we're working on, um, drove the template pattern to be a bit more complex than we actually initially imagined it to be, unfortunately. But that's how things go. All right. Any questions? So far? You can stop anytime, all right? Put your hand up and yeah, we can talk about it. So what's considered bad? So inheritance. It's it's funny thing, like you learn about inheritance and say, yeah, okay, I can create these abstract lines and go ahead and create these multiple domain objects that contain all of them contain an ID and the last update date in a name. Really? It's not good. Alright? It's it's bad. It's bad. It's really bad. It abstracts logic. Uh, sometimes even if you're on your on your uh, if you have not domain classes but business classes you see that abstracts information from you, and it's just sometimes you end up with multiple levels of abstraction. It would be so hard for you to find out the root cause of the problem that you just uh, you just go crazy, you know, have like three or four cups of coffee a day, which is drives you nuts. Um, inheritance. Talking to colleagues at work, like, okay, you apply that lightly. Do you apply in domain classes? Yeah, lightly. All right, you don't you don't create one like base model. Java kind of thing, that everything else in your domain classes will actually have that. Don't do that. It's, it's a bad thing, and, and you usually use your domain classes mapping to database tables and stuff, and if you're not careful, you, you let your Java modeling lead to your database modeling, 
um, if you're working on your project. And that stuff will just we just draw like a like an octopus in a I don't know kind of a metamorphose kind of thing. You know, it's it's horrible. So try not to use it, and if you use it, be really careful about deciding where to put stuff. One level abstraction, yeah, that's fine. More than that, you might want to be a bit careful. Maybe want to have an interface, um, and yeah. And don't overuse it. Otherwise, people look at your code and say, no, that's over engineered, you don't want that stuff. Utility pattern. Um, so that's kind of funny one. Utility patterns, what I, what I have seen so far was related to, it's a, it's, it's a put in between quotes because it's not real pattern per se. It's not from the Gang of Four kind of thing, but it's something that's actually used, I saw it being used quite a lot in the industry. Someone creates a final class, and this final class has a bunch of static maps in it. And they also have a bunch of stack of constants in it. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, Jesus Christ, why do we do that? You know, it's hard to test. Uh, you can't really inject that stuff into other classes to test the dependency. Um, and it just becomes over bloated. If you have to create a utility, make sure that you find the right place for it. What I found, for instance, uh, one of the libraries that we use quite a lot is the Commons library, Commons Lang library. No? Uh, here you go. One, two, here you go. Nice. Yeah. Um, so the Commons Line library provides a bunch of utility stuff for manipulating strings that don't, don't come with the uh, default Java API, which is very interesting. It's actually very, very helpful because it, it enables you to write faster code, enables you to write code that's more testable, and uh, if you don't, uh, and using those libraries, you don't, you don't really have to think about solving those problems. Somebody else has already done for you. Um, and that's the thing with utility. So if you're writing utility, make sure it, it makes sense in the context of what you're writing. If you write a library, yeah, I would say it makes sense, but also depends on the context. Don't write that in an application that's, let's say, for a website and stuff like that. Or if you write on GUI with uh, JFrame, who use that anyways? Um, yeah, so stuff like that. So um, yeah. And also overuse your patterns. So you don't, you don't want to use patterns just because they are there. Like I said that before, right? Yeah. Um, and patterns within patterns. Sometimes you'll find that patterns may call patterns. You know, like uh, I saw controllers before actually invoking commands. Um, I saw singletons being injected in controllers and stuff like that. It's kind of weird sometimes, you know, you see that sort of stuff. Maybe what you want is just your, the layers of your application are not really structured properly. Uh, you guys probably heard of the three layer application model, yeah, so you have, you know, MVC, MVC as well, okay, yeah, good, everyone, MVC, cool. So, you just have to be careful, you don't want to overuse that stuff, because at the end of the day, uh, you just end up with bloated code, it will be hard to maintain, um, and it will be hard to read, and that's, and that's a real challenge, when you have five pages of imports on your, on your class, which, what I'm going to show you, yeah, we had that. Uh, so, some code, yeah, let's look at some code. <coughs> Where are we at? So, buffers. Oh my god, Windows. Um, Alright, so singleton. Where's my singleton? Here you go. So, singleton, yeah, fairly straightforward. There's no news about that stuff, right? You guys know, you guys have been there, you know how to get a singleton and stuff like that. Um, but, what if we want to use the singleton somewhere else? Oh, look, we have a factory of my singletons, uh, which may give different singletons. So, does that make sense? Well, sometimes you find that stuff, and that, that's weird, right? I mean, you look at that, so like, oh, what the hell, you know? Your factory, a factory is supposed to, to do stuff for you that may be way too complicated for you to do in, let's say, a controller. So you inject a factory and say, hey, factory, give me that object, and then we do that for you. Passing, of course, the appropriate parameters and if, if you need some. In this case, it's a very simple example that I just put together last time. Um, but you don't want st stuff like that, okay? Why? Well, it's, it's bloated code, okay? You can just inject the singleton in your class and have that give the object for you. And you start. It's done. Yeah. Now, another sample here that I had was, where is it? So the command. Yeah, where's my, where's my other command? Is that? Yeah, oh yeah, that's it. So here you go. We have a, an abstract command class. Like, hold on a minute. Why do you have all this logic over there? You know, why do you have, I mean, 
when we get a user over here in an abstract class, does every command needs to get a user? Does that command needs to get a work? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's a data bean command. Maybe it can be in bean. It could be Java parameterized as well. Um, and it, after passing this first page of rubbish, um, you get down here. Ah, oh, here's the guy that you have to implement <laughs> to perform. Um, and it's just, <laughs> it's just uh, like this is old code, right? So we're talking like more than more than six years code that we had to had to deal with at this current project. It's not good, unfortunately. It could be done in a very different way. And and then this guy over here. That's the thing. Where's my other command? Ah, oh, here you go. Um, now notice that this is called data bin command. And the guys that inherits it is called data add log event CMD. Really? You know, why don't you just write command? <laughs> you know? and, and that's one very important thing in the industry as well. Uh, find time to name things properly. Um, uh, there, there was a quote from someone, which I forgot the name, and I also forgot the second part of the quote. <laughs> But the first part of the code says one of the hardest, one of the hard, there are two hardest things. The first thing is to name things. Right? The second thing I forgot. Um, but it is true, right? When you are in there in the industry, you're like, oh, proud to have to get this piece of code done, and oh, we're doing TDD. Oh yeah, let's find a meaningful name for the test, and then you stop. You stop because it's it's hard. I mean, sometimes sometimes you find things like yeah, okay, it's it's right there in front of you. You know exactly how to test. But sometimes your test may involve so many things and even so many dependencies and you'll find, damn, what is this thing doing again? And, and you guys did uh, tests, unit tests and stuff like that. So you're familiar with that stuff, mocking yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, so I'll see if I can find an example. Oh, no, I don't because the code's not here. Uh, it's there. Anyways, um, I found there was a there was a time uh, about uh, two months ago where we had an implementation of a class pretty much like that, but there was a lot more dependencies in it, and we had to test one change to the code. It was one line change, and we had to test it. The test itself had 20 lines, only because we're mocking expect mocking the classes and setting expectations on the mocked objects. So I'm, I'm looking at that and like. Oh. God, I'm gonna kill myself. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's not a good thing. So you want to make sure that your mock is meaningful. You also want to make sure that your tests are uh, are kind of um, meaningful as well. Yeah, go. I was just gonna say, if you're mocking so many objects to test a simple method on a class, you're gonna do a lot of setup to set for your mocks to add the dependencies for that class. Yeah. Could there actually be a design problem with the class itself? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you guys heard of TDD, right? Yeah, so um, there was a lot of discussion last two weeks about TDD being actually helpful. Um, you might, if you Google it, you'll find a post from Martin Fowler, who is a, a guy who works for from ThoughtWorks, uh, works for ThoughtWorks yeah. in the US. Very smart guy. He came to Melbourne, to think of it a couple of times to give talks on conferences, mostly on Yale. And uh, there was him, another guy who created Ruby on Rails, yeah. uh, DHH, I forgot. Very good, yeah, your English is better than mine. Um, um, and, and another guy, with Zanko Bob, who is also a very, very smart guy in the industry, set out a lot of, um, uh, a lot, a lot of smart thinking for people these days. Anyway, so this guy was discussing, hey, uh, DHH actually said, what about TDD? You know, TDD is like, it's gonna die, man. I don't do TDD everywhere. Um, and it's, it's kind of true. When you're in the industry, you try to use tests and TDD to influence your design decisions and make sure you have your appropriate dependencies in there. So when you go and write your classes, you say, oh, that makes sense. You know, I have the appropriate level of decisions and exactly what the class that you do, and my abstractions are fine. This guy is saying, hey, I don't do TDD anymore. You know, what's going on? So it's, it's interesting to look it up, look for for that sort of discussion. There was a video last Friday. These guys debated for half an hour Google Hangouts. So it might be worthwhile yeah, checking it out. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, did I answer your question? Yes. Good. All right. Uh, so let me see if I have something else <coughs> here. Oh, Actually, kind of. Kind of, OK. So the question is, Yeah. so even though the test has got a lot of mocking to that, um, yeah, it, it's like, 
in the dependency, but the class has got so many dependencies, it's yeah. just a bad design of the class because there are so many dependencies. It is, yeah. Well, the short answer is yes. Okay, uh, but it, it also you have to consider <laughs> you have to consider the situation at the moment as well, right? It's it's a tough it's a tough call. You can look at the class and say, yeah, look, there's like 15 dependencies in here. I'm actually, I'm actually going to show you that, um, and it is a fundamental problem because it's a lot of people just <coughs> putting stuff in there that are not supposed to be there. Maybe they're lazy. Maybe they just like had to get the thing in a hurry and get it out the door. And that happens quite a lot, but essentially your answer is yes. It's a sign of bad design, and if you can refactor it, yes, absolutely, go for it if you have the time. What you find is that there's a lot of politics around refactoring as well in the companies. Um, we're just going with one right now, and I'll talk about that later, <laughs> which is a funny one. Cool. All right. Uh, do I have any other thing to show right now? No, not at the moment. Okay, so I'm just going to go with um, All right, so the journey. Um, so as I said, I'm finishing up a security project at National. So this is a company that was um, started in Melbourne, and now they're pretty much all over the world. Um, very nice guys, great engineering team, great culture. And they had two projects which I can tell what they are. It's about uh, multi-factor authentication and single sign-on with their client's network. Very interesting, kind of challenging. Um, yeah, as soon as I look at the code base, uh. <laughs> so it is an MVC kind of project. So you have a web UI, you have a lot of backend stuff, and you have a lot of um, homegrown stuff, essentially um, associated with the database migrations, which is a hairy thing to do. Um, so yeah, code base is more than 10 years old, which when you look at it the first time, when you actually realize what you had to deal with, you're like, oh my god, <laughs> previous. Um, so the challenge, so implementing a new feature that would add new functionality to the logon process to enhance security and client requirements while refactoring your old database. Without refactoring, we couldn't have done it, right? I mean, okay, let me, let me, let me re say that in a different way. If we didn't refactor the code, we're probably going to be in deep ass right now. <laughs> and the code would be totally unmaintainable, and I'm pretty sure that people will never hire us again. Um, so we did have to go through that challenge, and it was, was tough, uh, because one, this part of the code that we're dealing with was about 10 years old, was one of the first class the guys ever written. Um, two, the tests that were written for it was, were absolutely, um, didn't, have, didn't add anything, really, didn't add any value on that. It was just mocking stuff and checking that the mocks were actually fu like filled their expectations, I'm like, really? Why? Um, and, and three, the actual, uh, you guys heard of functional tests? Behavioral tests? Yeah. Yeah? BDD. Okay. Yeah, BDD, yeah, okay. Um, they didn't have any. They, had, they use a kind of game, that's it. <laughs> and the browser is driven, and they're using a password designer, and like, oh, okay, well, thanks. <laughs> you know, that's not really testing much. Uh, so we had, so before we actually go, like, is that, is that a word, sir? Yeah. Before died, died. Yeah. Okay. Died. Yeah. died. Oh, thank you very much. So before we went there, <laughs> um, we said, you know what? We have to test this stuff. We can't really go blindly like that and and just just believe it's going to work. You know, for as much for as much as we think we are, we can't really just punch code out there and say, hey guys, you know, that's there. Oh, where's the test? And, uh, yeah. Well, you know, that's all I had time for. Um, now, so we had to go back and test it. Um, so in order to do that, that's what we had before. Okay, it was a class, and this class had a bunch of stuff in it, ifs and switches and, and loops and, and, and dependencies and imports and uh, all, all all the stuff that you can actually think of. Um, I think I can show you now. Yeah, I can show you now. Um, here you go. So, so that's how it was before. Oh, right. Alright, so that's page number one. Page number two. What? Page number three. So a bunch of static stuff, right? Some, uh, some constants. Page four, right? Page five. Oh, look, there's a constructor. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here we go. Oh, look, some business logic. Oh, my God. 
Oh, look, look at that. You're looking, can you see? Let me see if I can highlight that stuff. Uh, where is it? You see that? So that's a parameter in the request, right? Oh, look at that. We're using the parameter to, to decide what to do. What is that? That's routing. Okay, so we're deciding on routing using a parameter. Uh, it was, it's just it was bad. <laughs> um, and along with that, we have all this business logic here associated with uh, with uh, like direct linkings. We have something called direct linkings, which is you receive a link in your email, click on it, and it goes straight to the resource that uh, you want to go into the app. And you have this logic in here as well. Um, and also there's oh look, there's the logon action logic. And and over here we also have logon action. Just let me finish this and. And down here, oh look, we have a switch. Oh, what the hell? Yeah, so all, all the all the user decisions associated with oh look, are you locked? Are you disabled? Are you are you a valid user? Did you enter your password card? It's all here in one place, um, which has can you see the line count here? Okay, at the bottom. All right, so keep looking at it. All right, I'll just keep going down. Here you go. Look at that. How's that? Oh, never stops, guys. Here you go. Ah, oh, look, it's over. Uh, 1226 lines, how's that? Yeah, that's good, huh? Yeah. Sorry, I had a question. Yeah, I was actually more remembering of looking at a very similar, similar piece of code written in mm -hmm. basic.net. Ah, yeah. Oh, oh, I, for for ASP.net. Okay, yeah, I, yeah I, yeah, I'm not sure if I want to know. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay, so we have that stuff. So what did we do with it? You know, we knew that there was too much logic in there. There was too much uh, routing stuff. There was too much of too, too much of a muchness in there going on. And we said, can we apply anything to it? Well, we deliberated and deliberated, and we thought, okay, so there's some business decisions in there. We can't really we can't really change the logo because the clients have bookmarked this stuff on the browsers. I'm like, oh my god. So what can we do? Can we can we can we use the new way of doing things? Because this stuff. Uh, I don't know if you notice, but down here is oh implements oh sorry yeah so that's not a real new one okay so before this guy actually extended a base controller or a base action controller and that had had a lot more business logic than these it's actually it's a the lines of code are actually a bit more than that. Um, and a bunch of dependencies on um, static methods that were used in this class and was just made harder and harder to refactor that stuff. But we did it. We did it. So what did we decide to do? Well, we looked back at what we knew and what our experience was before. And we said, can we apply some patterning here? You know, Could we apply uh, uh, what's not? Can apply a template in there for every single one of them? Because we knew that there were logic, there, there, there was stuff in there that was routing. And we knew that depending on, that was the way they did routing for that specific thing. And we knew that with that if, we had to abstract that somehow. So we could test every single unit of code. Um, so can I apply a template? Like, yeah, okay, we can apply an interface. All right, so let's interface that guy up. So we create an interface. Can we apply uh, some sort of strategy for that stuff? Mm, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, what we ended up doing was moving all those ifs with what you do with the value of that action to a routing control that sits in front of everything, which is that stuff. Uh, here you go. Routing control sits in front of everything, and that invokes, depending on the action, invokes every single one of them. Is that a strategy? Well, no. <laughs> okay. But it's a simple, simple way to do things. Did we need a strategy for that? Honestly, no. Why? Because the decision was so simple. It was like, look at the value of this attribute and call this guy. We didn't, hit, we didn't have to go to lengths in order to identify what sort of algorithm to invoke. Okay? We just had to say, if this, then that kind of thing. And that's where a map comes in handy. Key value pair, invoke an object, make that abstract, like we did the controller action, and just make the, the map of type string and controller action, the interface. Off you go. You know, execute the class, and then you can have as many subclasses or implementations of the interface as you want. 
Of course, you don't want to go crazy, right? You don't want to have 500 of them um, for every single kind of action you may have. Sometimes it makes sense for you to look at the code and say, okay, this is actually part of this controller. So we might as well just make them together. Uh, there is also the case of no action. So what is that? So we have to have a default controller that can handle this sort of situation, you know? And these sort of things start rising up, and then we make the sign decision on that. So you can clearly see that we have lots of decisions there in one class, control logic in there, and business logic on these other objects. So what are these other objects down here? Um, they are actually, um, they process the results of our authentication. Behind this guy, over here, authentication steps, which I'm not going to tell, sorry. Um, behind this guy, there's a lot of other dependencies. They're actually very well designed, so they have been done later, uh, later in the day, I would say, or later, after, after this whole controller that I just showed you over there with a thousand lines. And they are very nice, they are the couple, they have, uh, they have a good cohesion between them, and, and they are very nicely done. So what we really need is just something to abstract all the logic and make it simple for the controllers to authenticate without having, without having to have all that dependencies wired, wired up to them. And that's what authentication steps is. So, so the question is, do we, do we move all those dependencies, those trend dependencies, to that authentication steps over here? Uh, well, not really. Okay. You remove what's meaningful, and then you inject that authentication step into the controllers where applicable. And that's how it works, because then you have that sort of ping-pong pattern that you go, hey, authenticate for me, okay, here's the results. All right, so now we go to the processor, which is that authentication information processor, and say, hey, can you just process these results? Yeah, sure, no worries, I'll just evolve whatever it is on my, uh, on my process thing that checks the contents. So I look at that and say, sure, no worries, I have this stuff, or is it good to the unknown user processor, or is it good that? So what did we gain with that? More complexity? Yeah, well, I would say so, yeah, but it's not over-engineered, okay? It's not something that you look at it like, why, you know? Why do you have to have that stuff in the middle over there? Sometimes it makes sense for you to take stuff out and say, this guy has to do one thing and one thing good and it has to be testable, and it has to be injected in multiple classes. How do we do it? Can we create a single tone? Well, not really. Um, so we just start iterating and think about patterns and think about, okay, so we can do this stuff over here, have this stuff return that, have that other guy process all these results and make sure that at the end, we, are, we have what we want, okay? Which is send the user to the appropriate page depending on um, the results. Any questions? No? Right, so all that, so 200, no, 1200 lines of code became. There's a little bit in here, but here you go, 164. All right, so that's the logon actually handling logon, okay? Actually uh, dealing with stuff that is associated with it. Um, and pa, 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 yeah, yeah, there's some odd stuff in here. Uh, pa, da, 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 so what else we have here? So um, what we want um, to show you is that guy over here. So the logo, the actual logo action, which is the guy that will go and get authentication information, which you do some decisions that are associated with the process of logon. Later in the day. Uh, like right now, we're just finishing the second part of the implementation of this project, which is a single sign-on. And we actually we had to refactor that, and it came in very handy, because we knew that the logic that was associated with single sign-on in the logon process actually fits well here. Sure, it touches a lot more classes, and we had to create new classes as well, but it was easy to refactor and find, yeah, that's the point in here, that's the point in there, and that's the point in there. Oh, look, I need a new class over here. And all that fit quite nicely with the stuff we have created. Again, did we use a pattern? Nah, well, no. I think if you look at that stuff, you might find something, some association with uh, maybe commands, maybe some association with, um, uh, with templates as well. But at the end of the day, we have implemented what we thought was fit for the purpose of the organization, okay? Based on the constraints that we had. We couldn't, um, we couldn't really, touch 
the way the logon, like change the u u URLs of the logon. Why? Because customers have bookmarked that. I mean, really, you know, that's that's a business decision. So we don't like we don't really have control over that. So we had to maybe deal with stuff that was associated in that. And and also there was a lot of fear of change as well, unfortunately, in this code base, uh, simply because things break easily. So we just try, yeah, okay, no worries. Uh, we try our best, let's see what we come up with. And we end up creating quite a few number of classes, all right? But the good thing is that we group them logically and it's easy to find where things are. Uh, it's not having to dig through 1,200 lines of code and find, ah, the logic is here on line 756. Right? It's at least not like that anymore. We still have to find some stuff. Sometimes, sometimes things get hairy and some scenarios that we get on like, Oh my God! But at least it's it takes us much lesser time now than it used to take us before, which is pretty good. Um, and that's that's pretty much what we want. Yeah. So why did we do that? Um, testability, extensibility, readability. So we want we want all this readability over there um, to be there, right? We, we want to test that stuff. We want to make sure that whatever we created can be extended. People can look at that star, uh, at that and say, hey, okay, I can just add a new guy over here. Oh yeah, I can just inherit that class and implement that interface kind of thing. Although, uh, forget about what I said inherit. Okay, discard that. <laughs> um, so that's what we did. And every class that we created has a test and the test is meaningful and we test not only the logic of the class but the association with the dependency as well. And mocking was reduced quite a lot. We still had to do some, but you can run away from it these days, unfortunately. So, yeah, I said that before. Um, I don't need to read that, right? Okay. Um, okay, Spring Framework. So some guys here know Spring Framework. I, 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 like, I don't work for Spring. I never contributed on Spring. Um, I like it. Okay, I think it's a mature framework. And it provides... A, abstracts a lot of what we have to do in order to deliver a solution. Um, and mostly Spring Security as well is a very nice, if you have to deal with that sort of stuff security-wise, it's cool. It's, it's very nice and extensible and it's flexible, which makes a difference. So what I'm saying is steady. You know, it's, it's massive, <laughs> I know, but it's, it's pretty cool. And you, you see that things are named properly and uh, it, it's easy to find your way around the API as well. The only thing is the Spring Framework, and as with any framework really, you find that you stuck to the framework, but again, that's your decision, right? Uh, if you decide to use a framework, you stuck on the framework, and if you want to change, you use Spruts, which you don't want to use, or, or, or that Google thingy, uh, what was that? Um, you remember that Google engine thing that you write everything in Java? Anyways, that stuff's horrible. So it's a horrible framework, and you don't want to go that way. Uh, so yeah, it's, that, like, it, it's, it's widely used in corporates. Every, I, don't, I can't remember a project here in Australia that I haven't used Spring. Um, that's like a corporate thing. So just go for it. Lear, learn it. It's, it's pretty good. And if you want to understand patterns, yeah, it's nice stuff. So yeah, some final tips, I guess. Uh, as I said, name things properly. Do that. Take a time. Uh, even if it takes 10 minutes. You're like just staring at the screen and like, yeah, going through my dictionary right now. Yeah, I think that should be something. Go for it, you know, actually spend the time on it because it's good, it's meaningful. And people that will maintain your code will look at that stuff and say, yes, that makes sense. You know, it's actually doing what it's doing. And not only for classes, for new classes, for tests as well. If you see a test that is doing more than you're supposed to do, break it down, or rename it, or whatever, you know, it's just tests. They will run anyways. And you ensure the quality of your code is better. So, and also, like, patterns and OOP concepts and stuff, they're not, like, religious things that you have to adhere to in the industry. You really challenge them. Like, make sure that you can actually get on there and say, yeah, that's fine, but if you do that, it's actually better to have less lines of code and it makes more sense, and the code is simpler. Does that make sense? Maybe it does. Right? So challenge it. And less is more. Let's try, don't overcomplicate stuff. If you have to use a pattern, 
make sure that the pattern actually adds value to the code, adds value to the feature, and everyone else in the team is happy with it. I had countless sessions while doing this whole refactoring thing at this company with, with one of my team members. We just stopped coding and went to the whiteboard. We said, you know what, let's, let's just stop because it's just getting too complicated. Let's draw some boxes. And we did. It was, was great. You know, We knew, we, we got a vision, we knew exactly what people were doing, we knew, okay, we had to do this, this, and that. No worries, how do we achieve that? Oh, we could do this, we could do that. And then you start drawing and then you go nuts and go grab a coffee kind of thing. Which is, which is great, you know, it's a, it's a great way to cooperate with the team members and make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, okay, can I just say that? Yeah, okay, so, uh, Rock, Rainbow Heights of Kindness, so, it's just a little bit of uh, propaganda. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's a good thing, okay, so Rock is a community event. It's, it happens all over the world. Um, here in Australia, there's memory Sydney, uh, Europe, US, all over, South America. So there's people contributing to enhance your community. And what we do, we have people that come with problems and say, hey, can we, um, can we solve this? You know, we have this, this thing, can we write something to make life better for that kind of group of people? And that's what we do. We have people of many skill levels, uh, not only technical, we have business people, we have designers, we have scientists, whatever. And it's not only like, oh yeah, I know you like, it's, it's, not, it's not a team of people that know each other. We just go there and hack for the weekend. So, it's going to happen at the end of the month. Um, it's great. Um, there's the website, and you can look at projects. If you want to sign up, it's free. There'll be pizza, there'll be beer, um, there'll be pub. Uh, <laughs> so, here we go. Um, so yeah, come on. We, we sponsor that, which is pretty cool. And uh, if you guys want to come along, just come talk to me or, or hand your business card and stuff like that. Um, and I can put you in contact with the guys. It's, it's a very fun event and, and people are pretty cool with it. Yeah. I went to the one in December. All right, there we go. Yeah, so you can talk to your colleagues yeah. about it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I learn a lot. Absolutely, yeah. It's, uh, it's thumbs up um, kind of thing. Um, yeah, so content information, so there's GitHub stuff in there, me, the company I work for, my Twitter. Uh, there's this uh, presentation, there's a, it's online, okay, uh, you can just grab it, uh, look at the code and stuff like that. And yeah, that's it. Um, any questions? Thank you. Any questions? So you know what to do, right? Before you submit your final assignment to refactor. Yeah. With the uh, bad code you were showing us, what platform or what uh, framework was that actually running on in the web? Was it um, Spring? Spring. Yeah, Spring. Um, was very old. That that first one that I showed you was really really old, and it wasn't the first time when Spring had the controllers on Spring were not very well defined yet. And we had to do some things at the uh, serverless level. So some of that stuff is still hairy. Uh, and it's still lingering around. We're moving, like, the, to be honest, Spring, Spring on version one was very, very crude, very raw. Uh, was mostly trying to deal with servlets. Version two, they introduced some sort of controller uh, kind of concept, which was very well received, but you still have to pass a lot of objects around. Um, and then 2.5, they introduced annotations which made life, made life a lot better and was easier to, uh, to deal with that stuff. And version three, they completely abstract the controllers and made the whole thing just injectable. They had a, mo a whole web, web MVC um, package uh, in the Spring framework and was easy to write controllers and make sure you test them. Version four has a lot more new stuff, which I haven't looked at it yet. In the app, we actually have these three versions going on. So we have servlet base, we have the 2.5 base with some dependency injection in there, and we have the annotation stuff going on now. And it's, uh, it's hard. <laughs> but you know, you go over that and you try to understand, try to make sure like, yeah, that's cool, let's go ahead with it and let's uh, make sure we do a good job with that stuff and yeah, that's it. So what do you think about Spring? Uh, we have a course on J2EE. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So maybe we should uh, change more to Spring rather than JPOE because it's, uh, the new version of JPOE is for annotations and all that. Well, JPOE, it, uh, it derived a lot of their stuff from Spring actually. Right, yeah. um, and JPOE, the, the thing about, that's my view, okay? <laughs> so I don't know about anything. But JPOE is something that's uh, Java, like Java standards compliance. <laughs> Spring's not. Yeah. All right? And, and that's, why, that's why I see a lot of universities, uh, at least the one I went to, using J2E, teaching J2E yeah. and teaching using Glassfish and NetBeans. Yeah. Because that's, that's what Java it's can offer. You can learn as well, right? So, for somebody learning from. Yeah, more or less. Okay. More or less. Um, all the tools come to all come together, right? As in one package. Yeah, you see, <laughs> Glassfish, uh, you guys heard of Glassfish? Yeah, well, everyone had a glass feature. Yeah, yeah. Well, sorry, it sucks. Okay, <laughs> uh, what we use in the industry is Tomcat, and Tomcat is very easy. So, like, you get a zip file, download, run the uh, the shell, and uh, look, it's up. And sure, it it's, it doesn't provide a nice interface for you to deal with that stuff, deployments, and and, and some other uh, JMX management and stuff like that, but. It's what, what the industry wants, you know? They want you to get well, up and running quickly. And they want you to, hey, here you go, it's up and running, here's the app, oh, look, it's deployed, off you go, kind of thing. So that's what we want, agility. Um, NetBeans, I tried, I'll be honest, I tried to use it in the industry, I couldn't, okay? Um, because it was so deep down into the, uh, the Java, it's like Java way of doing things, and say Java standards of doing things, that was hard to be productive on it. Nowadays, <laughs> when three years ago, a lot of people were actually in Eclipse. And I'm like, yeah, Eclipse, yeah, cool, it rocks. It doesn't, it doesn't, all right? What rocks today is IntelliJ. Um, and IntelliJ is not free, but it is the best ID out there. I yeah. agree. There you go. Say, hey, go on, over. There is a community version of There is, oh yeah, that's right, but it don't get as many um, features. Yeah. Yeah, um, and a lot of people in the Ruby community that I saw in JavaScript community they use Sublime, uh, which is very extensible and it's lovely. I yeah, I just enjoy that so much. It's pretty cool. Me too. There you go. Yeah, another one. Ah, here you go. Nuts. Head nuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So if you if you should change, well, I I don't know. Um, what I see the industry is going with is is a lot of spring. A lot of guys, if you have a small if you have a small web project, people go with Ruby on Rails. I saw that Census, for instance, and uh, NAB, they use Play Framework, which is a completely different way of doing things as well in terms of Java. It actually inherits a lot of the stuff from Ruby on Rails. It's a pretty cool framework. It gets you up and running just like that. Um, but use that with Java, and you're going to be sorry. Um, <laughs> use that with Scala. And you're going to go for a huge bump over the learning curve. But as soon as you get going, oh, it's cool. It's so fast. And, and there are some engines built on top of it, sorry, it's trying to. Um, there are some engines built on it, like uh, CSS processors, CoffeeScript processors, um, database migrations, um, ORMs, and stuff like that, that just make our life easier. So that's pretty cool. All right. That's it. All right. And just one more question. One more question. Some of these students may be looking for jobs soon. Yeah. So what what skills do you think they should pick up? Like yesterday, I was talking to one of my colleagues who was um, uh, outside, and he was saying the kind of skills that the minimum skills you should have yeah. to become a developer. So maybe you can. Okay, I can talk about that. Um, well, when I when I moved to Australia, uh, what I want to do, I want to work on Java. I thought Java is my life. Oh yeah. I got a Java project, be happy, kind of thing. No. All right. So you get out there and then you say, oh, look, that's Java. OK, but there's also CSS. Oh, there's this new thing on CSS called LAS and SAS. Oh, there's also Stylus. Oh, what's all that? Oh, look, there's JavaScript. OK, let's pick up JavaScript. No, no, there's also JavaScript. It's better. Oh, really? Um, and then you can just keep going. Uh, the company I worked for, we uh, I said that before, we categorize ourselves as polyglot developers. Why? Because we, we really have to handle whatever is out there. We're consultants, 
and we're drawn with these different kind of projects. Majority of the people out there, uh, the company I work for, uh, they, uh, they are Ruby guys, and they love it. Um, but some of them really like Groovy. Um, a lot of the guys know iOS. I, I, want, I was one of the, 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 the guys um, in the team that implemented Australia Post Digital Mailbox. I don't know if you guys heard of it. Yes. Yeah. So I implemented, implemented the, the, uh, the iOS app as well, implemented the backend interface. And the backend interface was in Groovy. Um, and there was the iOS app. IOS. And there was another guy uh, implementing the Android stuff. And there was all sorts of other skills in there. So I would say that like, if you want to be a specialist, that's fine. You can be a specialist and you can focus on specific technology. But I'm pretty sure if you go out in the industry, you're going to be left behind. Because nowadays, people expect you to know that stuff. They expect you to know about less CSS, about SAS, about JavaScript. Doesn't, you don't have to be an expert, but you have to get a job done. right? That means knowing about patterns on every different language. Maybe, maybe, maybe not, right? What probably your first job gonna be maintain this stuff for me. You know, you can do it, you know, you can look at that tech code and say, Yeah, I know what's doing here, I know what's what kind of pattern is actually applying, I know what kind of uh, um, paradigm is actually going on here. Um, so you can evolve that. When you have to create a new one, you already have that experience. So what I usually do in, in terms of getting a new project, oh look just going to start in closure now. Um, and what I usually do, if it's a new project where everyone in the team is learning, or there's someone with a senior level kind of thing already no closure, so he can teach us. But if we have a project that's already written in closure, you go for the tests. Look at the tests, see what they're doing, you know. And you identify some patterns in the tests and that will that will drive you in the direction of oh that's what's going on, you know. And then you start to understand how the code works, how what sort of skill set you actually need to have, or understanding of the language uh, you're actually picking up. Did I answer your question? Yes. Good. All right. All right. Cool. All right. Thank you. Just a small bit uh, of RMIT. I oh. really appreciate your taking your oh, time. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Please, we've got to do that more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can come back next time, sir. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. <coughs> a little help. Thank you. You Thanks take guys. all your stuff. Nice to see you. Bro. Pleasure. Okay, so um, you want to take a break? I actually, I was going to teach uh, Southern architecture today, but I decided not to include it in the exam. So uh, I shouldn't have told you that, right? <laughs> but of course, you, you don't study for just to, just for the exams, right? You study for the love of knowledge, am I right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So since there's only half an hour left, uh, what I'll do is I'll just um, briefly tell you, I think I already told you about the exam format. So as I said, it's going to uh, reflect what you have done in your assignments. There will be five exam questions. First one is multiple choice, uh, which just covers the breadth. And the second one is uh, DBC. Uh, uh, so basically, I'm not going to ask you to remember I contract, J contract, D contract, J uh, what not, just know what is in, uh, invariant, what is precondition, what is postcondition. That's what we want to take from this course because there's so many tools out there, there are many buggy tools out there. So, but if you can understand what is invariant, that's good enough. What is precondition? But again, it takes, still takes some time. It's not to say it's trivial. Uh, then um, I will just give some scenarios and ask you which patterns. So, as you probably realize now, there is no one pattern. As a, one Keith was telling me he gave some circles of uh, command or something every came up with about eight different patterns that are possible, right? So basically, even if you think this pattern is applicable, let's say abstract factory instead of something else, as long as you can justify it, that's fine, right? So there's no one answer. Then the other one would be, one would be a little bit more just writing the class diagram and uh, sort of uh, uh, basically uh, justifying it. 
right so that's what the exam is so what I'll do for next week I'll probably come up with a sample exam so that we can do it in the lecture and also just outline what the exam is so the week 12 will be your project so for those of you who came late uh, I hope you don't object that we uh, extended the project to week uh, week 12 right uh, what else? Is there any other feedback you want to give me? So I, I basically, I don't think I want to start on architecture, but if you want to, I can. I don't know. Maybe we'll just go through it. Since since we got 15 minutes, and you told me you don't study for exams, right? Just just for 10 minutes. By the way, what is the difference between architecture and design? Who is there any architects here? Architecture wasn't the relationship between the system. Right. So, uh, architecture is uh, also focusing a lot more on the quality attributes, like security, maintainability, extensibility, and whatnot. Right? Non-functional aspects. Yeah. So what, what, do you, what do you personally think? Do you, do you think uh, uh, we should expose you to a lot of the technologies out there? Mm -hmm. At RMIT? <laughs> okay. I mean one, one school of thought is just teach the basic concepts that the student go and pick up. But my personal view is that as he, as he said now, like 20 years ago, if you have knowledge with C, you can go and walk into a job. Right? But that's not the case now, right? Because there's so many different technologies, different paradigms. Just to get the job itself, as he said, you don't need to be an expert in all these. But if somebody asks you what is the Angular framework, what is this, and if you say, oh, I've got no idea what is closure, uh, yeah. I think learning the uh, sort of the individual, you know, making the individual languages available for learning, I don't see a huge value in that because they're always changing and evolving, but I think what I find a lot more value in is acquiring the skills that enable me to be able to pick up a language quickly. Right, so, such as uh, what skills would that be? Well, it's understanding, you know, programming right. generally and the yeah. components of how they interact. Yeah, I mean... I, I, I mean, that's, I just find that yeah. things change from year to year. That's true, that's true. Else. And yeah, but what what if you go for a job interview though? If they if they got five people coming for the job, you got only one vacancy. It's different. I don't know. Like, you know I've been working at it for a long time. Coming yeah. out of uni, yeah. I was selling myself on. Um, right. Uh, it's different to uh, once you got a bit of experience. You know, yeah, that's true. So I think uh, nowadays getting into the door is the problem. Once you get into the door, get through the door, then uh, basically. Um, I think understanding programming language semantics yeah. will actually help you learn about all the other languages that are. Yeah. Because every language has a particular set of rules for it's able to use that language yeah. to. So I was thinking one of the other patterns I must include next time would be inversion of control, mm. right? Because that's so, you know, a lot of the Spring framework, even uh, J2E, they're all based on that. So if you think of any other things that I should include in the course, please let me know. So. We can try and, uh, as, as you know, basically, uh, you know, uh, whatever improvement we make, we are not really given time, but we do it as part of, uh, you know. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I brought in, uh, what's his name, uh, Keith, because Keith's been in the industry, so he sort of says, you know, uh, what is important. And, for example, he was the one who was advocating to sort of incorporate DBC, right? So. It's a disciplined way of developing things. I think another one would be to include functional programming paradigms. He's been telling me about Scala, and I, t I told him it's kind of hard for me to fit Scala into object-oriented software design. But his land is in Java 8. Pardon? His land is or functional programming paradigms in Java 8. So oh, right, right. Yeah. Although it might fit into one of some of the other courses, right? Possibly. Yeah. Maybe advanced programming concepts. Right? Yeah. Or I'm software engineering program. process and tools, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 so I, I don't think throwing hats throwing has to be yeah. used That's true. And what what one good thing that has happened at uh, RMIT is that now we have capstone projects. Every student is required to do two of them. So actually that's the stage they should pick up these kind of uh, uh, tools and technologies and languages. 
but unfortunately my personal view is that students still need still need a bit of guidance right to get started with with those technologies because otherwise they have 12 weeks to do their thing so so basically uh, you know just uh, go through what architecture and design in a way i think they go together so um, basically it's just telling you the difference architecture faces towards strategy design is more towards implementation getting the job done being able to get all the functional aspects done that's what designers focus on right so next week we want to ask you something about extensibility remember you talked about it and uh, maintainability readability is basically maintainability and what are, what are, what other ets are there testability testability, testability right yeah yeah so as you as you saw you know that's what's important outside so architecture without design does nothing obviously if you just come up with a great architecture but you haven't actually done the implement uh, design and implementation design without architecture just focus on the problem now it doesn't think about what's going to happen 3 years from now what what are the technologies are going to be there and what's going to happen in the long term so good architects are rare would you agree with that yeah so uh, you know because architects i have to be not just on one problem they need to look at it from the security aspect from the usability aspect so you need to be someone with uh, you know multi uh, uh, multi focus if you like so what makes a good architecture is no such thing as good and bad architecture there are always trade offs would you agree something that is fast one that's high performance may compromise on security right so um so that's what basically requirements so basically this is just outlining this so i think that you know as you said uh, you know to be a designer you still should be able to aware of some of the other aspects like uh, functional requirements now most of the time we are focusing on functional requirements and this is my this has been my experience um when we give assignments students will hook or by crook they will get all the functional aspects done but you look at the code you will faint right <laughs> so uh, obviously we have to somehow give marks for that um, uh, you know uh, how maintainable how extensible and so on that's what we are going to do right your final presentation so after you do your thing you might we like you to do a bit of refactoring and try and see uh, so quality attributes as i said all these elites and constraints are things that cannot be changed they are fixed for example if they say the job must be done by end of june for the ato there is no way you can sort of change that constraints functionality and architecture so basically this is talking about um, quality attributes uh, consideration one would be performance i'm sure all of you know we got performance uh, testers uh, for example what is a performance test uh, testing tool that you use quality center uh the we um, jmeter i used to teach a bit of software testing we use tools like jmeter they are free but of course more sophisticated one quality center um and so on yeah. uh and availability i'm sure you know what it is with how long the website is down how long does it take to come up for example usability i'm sure you know so these are some of the quality considerations right so um problems with so often the problem is that uh, definitions are not testable and also uh, if you look at it from different angles from different perspective one may be fast but the other person may say this is not secure this is not easy to use and so on so there is always a kind of a compromise or trade offs so basically this is uh, listing the different ways you can measure the different quality attributes and so i just outlined uh, outlined this there are different aspects like availability performance and what they have done is just like you studied about design patterns they call it tactics tactics basically identify let's say availability what are the issues right so it says for availability first detect the faults try if the faults have already happened recover from faults and also prevent faults so this is if you like to think of it like some kind of a design pattern for for um, a 
quality attributes or architectural things. Similarly, there are modifiability tactics and I'm sure you've done most of these, right? Because you, you are thinking about your program should be extensible, encapsulate, uh, restrict dependencies, refactor, abstract common services. Now this is what I've done in uh, programming one now. I've given them an assignment. I've given them, as I said, a different kind of monsters and different kind of uh, player capabilities. Uh, some monsters can give birth, some monsters can jump over the players or and so on. So students somehow get it done, right? Hook or by hook, they will all get it to work. But then later on I tell them, look, I want you to abstract them. Try and move that to a common class as much as possible. Or obviously, ideally, as you heard before, inheritance is not all good. You don't tell that to the first year students. You tell them must study inheritance, inheritance is all good, but then later you realize most of the design patterns are actually using composition, yeah. right? So for example, decorator pattern or uh, even the uh, bridge pattern, they avoid having to create so many subclasses by loosely coupling them. So performance, again this is uh, performance tactics, how you can uh, do that and then the, obviously the other important thing would be security. So it again, just like design patterns, you have ways of detecting the attacks, resisting the attacks, or as, as you know, you either encrypt them, or if it's non-repudiation, again, you encrypt with my, uh, if you want to non-repudiate, you encrypt with my um, private key or public key. Basically, you only, you don't give your private key to anyone, right? So for example, if, um, I encrypt with my private key and send it to you and you can decrypt it with a public key later on I cannot deny that I send it to you because nobody else has the private key right so again so these are some of the techniques and then you probably would have done some courses on um, uh, access control for example is one way of uh, doing that right so anyway I'm not going to go into this and the other thing that I started thought about including it is like different patterns layer pattern, broker pattern, and uh, model view controller pattern which you looked, pipe and filter pattern, client server, peer to peer. So these are again architectural patterns, right? So I'm really teaching very fast this time. <laughs> so but anyway, I, I, I feel that as a designer, what do you think? Designers should be aware about the architectural aspects? Yes. Definitely, right? Because otherwise, you know, it will be very short-sighted, get the job done, but in two years time, the whole thing is going to, you know, fall down. So, so I think that's why uh, I, I decided uh, it's to, good to include one week of architectural aspect of architectural patterns. Right, so I think I will stop there. I won't take uh, any more of your time. So next week we'll have revision. I will, I will come up with a sample exam and post it to you, and then we'll discuss it in the lecture. Thanks, Thanks for the as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good to get those guys, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And more than that, I got Keith this time. Because, you know, Keith with 20 years of experience. So, obviously, there is always this balance. Because you can't, in a university course, you can't totally talk about industry practices. You know, so, but this tension is always there. But, you know, find the balance of that. In an exam, for example, I can't present a real life scenario. You know what I mean? In a two, in a two hour exam, if you present a real life scenario and ask them to sort it out, you know? So, but that's why the projects are useful. Because the reason I, I have these group projects is that students can learn from each other. You know, like for example, you have experience, the other guys who have no experience, they can, you know, look at your design and things and they can learn from one another. Yeah, that's right. I want to actually learn something. I thought the other thing I said, 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 I'm going to say
See, it wasn't when I did that course. Hmm? It wasn't when I did that course. Oh, didn't it? Oh, who was teaching Dave, was it? Margaret Hamilton. <laughs> um, <laughs> Margaret Hamilton was teaching it for the first time that year. Yeah. Um, you know, Dale, Dale was there b previous year. Oh, okay. Dale, and he's been teaching that course for 10 years. And oh, right. Yeah, because yeah, I feel like yeah, inversion of control, like touch dependency injection is super critical. Yeah. And the other thing I think is designing for testability. Right. And like minimizing and also the dependency. Also, in unit framework, the thing is that I don't think their unit is currently covered in any of the courses as yeah, far as I know. It's kind of glazed over in software engineering processor tools. Yeah. Where they're like, they make you write a couple of unit tests, but it's very cursory. Yeah. And like, they don't really sort of. So, uh, when I taught software testing about four years back, I introduced JUnit mm -hmm. and JMeter yep. for performance testing. Yeah, it's good for it. Later on, um, I think Isaac now teaching it. He made it totally a functional testing, black box testing, yeah, not right. a sort of unit testing. So this possibly you can put JUnit here mm. because it's to do with design, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's one area. But the problem here is because this is not a core, a lot of the things you mentioned, SVN, uh, 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 what's this, Maven. The build tool, right? Yeah, yeah, I talked to my colleague yeah. outside, so he said, "You go outside. If you don't know Maven, yeah, GitHub, yeah. Um, uh, uh, SVN, yeah. you, you can forget about it. You know, yeah, they're straight away going to say, hey, you know, you're not, you know, not well, ready so for the like, it's like we're hiring another engineer at the moment, and it's like for me, like the one that's going to be a killer is man. If they don't know how to write tests, like there's no way they're getting a job at our company." That's right, that's right. Like, so you know, testing is so important and like, um, yeah. obviously we were at Ruby and JavaScript, so our tests are in like Aspec mm -hmm. and like yeah. uh, Mocha, yeah. respectively. And it was yeah, like, there's something that's not covered. Yeah, I think the problem here is that uh, I think you are aware in the university, it's more and more they are focusing on research. Yeah, yeah. Publication. Oh, sorry, we yeah. spoke about the so, that's how so the thing is that for me to be learning all these things, I have to do it on top of mm publication and whatnot, right? So it's not easy, right? I mean, just as he, he himself said, just to keep up with all these technologies is hard enough. Yeah. So so I, I'm not sure how they're going to, you know, uh, RMIT one time used to be known as a technical mm. university, but because of the funding, I mean, blame Tony about or whoever. Oh, God. You know, and they, it's because everybody's... Well. Yeah. yeah, what's with that? Uh, just more interest to get a pay. Yeah. 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 So, you know, a lot of the things, the, we are just moving in a Melbourne Uni style. Yeah. So we, we are so sort of, you when know. When I used to go to Melbourne Uni, I hated that style, which is why I came to RMIT. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. What's that? I mean, it's all right here, it's okay. But Maybe they should create universities uh, that sh not all fit in the same mold. Mm. They should have some technical universities, like in some European countries, 
the technical uh, colleges or universities mm. are more popular than academic place universities yeah. because they train you for the job. Mm. Yeah, well, that's it. Like lots of companies as well, like actually do um, like boot camp courses and stuff. Like, yeah. so you can go and do like. Um, you know, if you know like a little bit, then you can go and do like a mm. six-month course through like yeah. uh, ThoughtWorks or like some of these companies. Like they mm. do these actual hands-on trainings. But what I think Isaac has done with SCPD now, since after Margaret mm. Isaac took over, yeah. and he has uh, get real yeah. outside projects, right? So uh, so when SCPD, mm. yeah. so he brings some outside thing. Again, the problem there is that obviously good students, you throw anything at them, they will yeah. catch. But some of the weaker students, they may not learn the, on their own. Yeah, well there's like a big, big, know, big gap. Big yeah. gap yeah. So yeah. when I heard, you know, some students said, oh, it's great, you know, we're working with real projects. Others said, oh, we've got no idea what we're doing. Yeah, because, okay. you know, yeah, because they don't pick up on their own. They want mm. somebody to. But I have the problem with capstone projects. Like, right. for example, last year I had some project students and I told them, guys, uh, they said they want to use PHP. I said, fine, but you must use the tool. Uh, 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 yeah, code igniter or Yara will yeah. these are two common tools please go and find out but they said oh, oh it's too hard to learn yeah just like you know. and then they go and like hand roll their own thing it looks like, like yeah it's so like a first year web programming uh, assignment yeah, yeah. or project yeah. you know so course, you course. can't go to real world and show hey look at my capstone project you yeah. know yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, like, I got my first, like, job at a software company, like, three years ago. It was CodeIgniter, and as much as I dislike PHP, I'm like, all right, cool, CodeIgniter, let's learn it. It took me, yeah. like, two weeks to get up to speed, and then, like, let's go. That's right. Uh, so, yeah, so, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I press the school, I say, at least bring in some speakers. Yeah, so, so I thought that was really great. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so it's... Um, Trying to find the you know right balance and I, I, the other thing I brought I brought Keith yeah. because you know Keith is 20 years of experience yeah. so at least he can you know obviously there is this tension between what is practical and what is academic we can't you know totally go uh, practical because then some students have you know will be totally lost if you talk to them about real life you know yeah so no, it's a it's a tricky thing yeah but yeah. anyway so. It's <laughs> So try and improve it based on your feedback next year. So you did SC, uh, sof SC software engineering and you finished it, huh? No, no, this, I'm still finishing it this year. Oh, okay. So you're, because you got a job, so you're not in a hurry. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, I just kind of, I was, a, uh, I started software late, like before I studied like art history and like I was oh, doing an arts degree. Okay. So they like, doing totally different things and then wanted to be a rock star and tried to be a musician for a while and I gave up on that and I'm like, and then I worked at a call center where they had all this really bad software written in Perl. Uh -huh. So I had to do this data entry and I'm like, this is terrible, I can write software better than that. And I, I'm like, all right, so I'm like, I'm going to go to uni and learn how to do it. Yeah. But uni <laughs> is, is more <laughs> academic now, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's shame. But, um, Unfortunately, you need a certificate to get in. Uh, the thing about that is yeah, maybe a paper. Like, imagine the students who go to Melbourne Uni, I don't think they learn many practical skills. Well, I but found when I was there, it was like, yeah, way more theoretical, because I did art science, mm. and so it was like, you know, was like chemistry and stuff, and like, that was like fairly practical, but like, you know, most of the other stuff, it's all kind of up here, and like, yeah. I know some other, like, because um, they have to do engineering, and do mm -hmm. systems engineering, mm -hmm. it's like a... I suppose major. those guys would become like, uh, you know, administrators, because where communication is important, Yeah. but it's, I think, still to get jobs like as a developer, you know, you need courses like, you know, which exposes you to, right, real world things. I'm not sure. So, yeah, I think it's just about surrounding yourself, like, you know, when you can, just mm. like with people that are much smarter than you and stealing their tricks. That's true. That's, that's my true. angle. And, uh, yeah, so that's why I myself am getting involved with the project with, you know, I was telling you, Angular Framework. Yeah, we're well. using Angular in our yeah. project. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Cool. So that for so <laughs> it's, it's late, all right. There it is. I know some students who got a bit stressed with the DVC tools, but then you know. Okay. Oh man, it took me it took me 15 minutes to write the code, and then five hours to get the goddamn yes. DVC <laughs> called, uh, tool to work. Yeah, that, that was rough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's no help on. No value on that. There's no, the no thing is that at the end of the day, for me, if you. Look